Okay, so in this video, we're going to take a look at some practice questions for the medical physics part of the course. So we're going to start off looking at x-rays, and we're looking at an x-ray tube, uh, which has several key parts we can use to explain how an x-ray tube works. Uh, so there are four parts that have been labelled, A, B, C, and the lead shield. And what we need to do is explain how the x-ray tube works and the physical processes which lead to x-rays being produced. Okay, so let's go through each of the parts and we'll ex do the explaining as we go through. So, the first part, labelled A, is a glass tube. And that is there to try and create a vacuum between the the filament or the cathode labelled B and the target or the anode labelled C. That's what we want because we don't want the electrons we're producing to be impeded by gas atoms. The next part we've got is the lead shield, the grey barrier you can see all around that only has one hole in it where the x-rays are going to travel. Because what we need to do is make sure we are minimising the risks to anyone using the machine and any operators, that kind of thing. And a lead shield will absorb any x-rays that travel that way. Uh, the next part is how we actually produce electrons, which are what we need to make x-rays. Um, so this uses the process called thermionic emission, and it does that by passing a current through the filament. Filament heats up and it gives the electrons enough kinetic energy to escape. And what happens then is they are accelerated towards the anode, uh, towards this target, which is labelled C. And what happens is they collide with orbital electrons in the target and they are excited. And when they de-excite, some x-rays are produced. And it's something like 1% of the de-excitations produce the x-rays we are looking for. Okay, so those are the parts and those are the processes by which we get x-rays. Okay, so an X-ray tube produces photons of energy 50 kilo electron volts. The half value thickness of the bone is 15 millimeters. Explain what is meant by half value thickness. So this is very strongly paralleled with half life in radioactivity. So essentially it's the distance the radiation must travel through a material for the intensity of the radiation to half. Uh, so a lot of people for this question put the energy to half. That's not true. It's the intensity or the power per unit area to half. Show that for 50 kilo electron volt x-ray photons, the attenuation coefficient is 0 0.046. Um, so this is fairly straightforward. We're just using the same kind of relationship you'd use in radioactivity. So if we do ln2 divided by the, th the half value thickness in millimeters, that will give us a a attenuation coefficient in millimetres to the minus one. Okay, so uh, final question on these this x-ray tube. Uh, 50 kilo electron volt x-ray photon is incident on a bone of thickness 12 millimetres. Calculate the percentage of incident photons that will leave the far side of the bone. So what we're going to do is I'm going to put in 100 as the incident percentage, and we want to know what the percentage is once it's gone through 12 millimetres, so we want to find x. And we're going to put in, well, I shouldn't have chosen x, we've got two x's now, um, so we're going to put in the decay constant, we're going to put in the actual thickness, 12 millimetres, and that so gives us a percentage on the far side of 57%. Okay. So continuing looking at x-rays, but from a different perspective. So now we've produced some x-rays and they've come out of the tube and we have a part we call a diaphragm and it's two pairs of lead sheets which can be moved at right angles to each other. And then what happens is the x-rays pass through an aluminium filter. So explain the use of lead sheets. Um, so this is very similar to the reason we use a collimator as part of the gamma camera. So um, that's what we're using it for to provide collimation and what that actually means is it allows photons traveling through parallel to lead sheets to pass and any traveling in other directions don't. So we're producing a fine beam of x-rays that go exactly where we want them. So the aluminium filter is there 
to remove the lower energy photons that we're making. So I said the process produces only 1% useful x-rays, so aluminium will filter out all the lower energy ones which aren't useful and would add to the dose of radiation. So that's their function. Okay, so we've got a monochromatic beam of x-ray photons. It's passed through an aluminium sheet of thickness 2.7 and its intensity is reduced by 8.3%. Calculate the mass attenuation coefficient of aluminium for these x-rays. Uh, so the first thing we need to do is calculate what the attenuation coefficient is, and then we can turn that into the mass attenuation coefficient. So the first thing we're going to do is calculate the percentages that we've got left. So 100 minus 8.3. And we started with 100%, and we know that the value of thickness is 2.7 millimetres. Uh, so what I'm going to do is calculate what the attenuation coefficient is and you'll notice that um, I've got the values there and we've got an attenuation coefficient of 32 meters to the minus one and this is as much as you need to do for the OCR specification I wasn't paying attention when I picked this question um, mass attenu attenuation coefficient is something that comes into the AQA medical physics uh, which is a bit more detailed but I'll show you how to do it anyway seeing as um, we gave you this question. So it's actually a really simple conversion. We just need to divide by the density and that will become mass attenuation coefficient. Um, so that's fairly straightforward and that would have the unit of meter squared per kilogram. But as I said, um, the only part you need for the OCR specification is actually working out the attenuation coefficient. Okay, so moving on to a different type of imaging now, positron emission tomography. Um, so we're going to compare them to ultrasound scans. So they're two different ways of producing images. And lots of the medical physics questions are these types comparing and contrasting the two types of imaging. So we're going to compare them in terms of safety and convenience and also in terms of the information you get. So let's start off with safety and convenience because there's quite a few points we could make here. Um, so if you have a PET scan, you will need to be in hospital for several hours. They've got to inject you, uh, get you to the machine, and it takes some time to process images. Whereas ultrasound, you can go in, they can get out straight away and produce images almost instantly. Um, so it's a very quick and easy process. Um, a PET scanner will set you back uh, millions, if not a hundred million. I think I looked this up online, they're very expensive. Uh, An ultrasound is relatively cheap. Um, so they are very easily available. Um, a PET scanner, so we're now moving on to safety, produces beta plus particles, which annihilate to produce gamma rays, which are ionizing. Uh, whereas ultrasound produces sound waves, which are not ionizing at all. So ultrasound would be classified as much safer. In terms of the experience for the patient, um, anyone who's afraid of needles is not going to enjoy PET scanning because you you inject it and anyone who's claustrophobic again is not going to enjoy a PET scan because it, you are very close in when you go into the detector whereas an ultrasound the only problem might be that they put a gel that might be a bit cold so there's really not uh, many disadvantages or discomforts for the patient. Okay so now let's look at the information available. Um, so a PET scanner produces very detailed images and it particularly images for the metabolic activity which is why we use it for um, diagnostic when we're looking at cancer because it tells us where very active cells are which is a characteristic of a cancer cell. Whereas ultrasound we use for looking at the boundaries inside us so we can't really tell how something's behaving, we can just look at what something is. So, oh, here's a bone, or oh, here's a baby, something like that. And the images it produces are pretty blurry. Um, but on the flip side of that, um, it's very easy to distort or ruin the images with a PET scanner. The patient must lie perfectly still, whereas an ultrasound can easily dim it, deal with moving patients. This is how you can see a baby, even though it's moving around inside the mother's body. So those are some of the points uh, that you would need to make to answer this question. I gave more than enough for this one, um, just to show you the different options. Okay, so looking at ultrasound in more detail, we'll take a look at the transducer you'd use in an A-type scan, where you'd measure like bone thickness or retina thickness, something like that. 
So all we need to do is referencing the diagram, um, describe the process we use to produce a short pulse of ultrasound. So we're not interested in the detection part, we're just looking at producing it. Okay, so there's a few key parts. So um, we're going to have to apply an EMF to the electrodes, and you can see we've done that because we've got a cable coming in supplying uh, the AC EMF. And we're going to need it at a pretty high frequency, so it produces ultrasound, so it needs to be above 20,000 hertz, so above the human hearing range. And then what we're going to do is when we apply the AC EMF to the electrodes, it's going to cause the crystal to expand and contract. That's why it's described as being a piezoelectric crystal. It can transfer between the electrical energy and elastic potential energy if it's changing its shape. And we pick a crystal specifically with a resonant frequency above 20,000 so that when it we supply it with a 20,000 EMF, it's in resonant, so it produces a large pulse of sound wave, which is what we're looking for there. So those are the points I'd make here. Okay, so now we're going to model it mathematically. So we've got ultrasound incident on a boundary between materials, and we've got this equation to work out how much is reflected by the boundary. So, um, what it wants us to do is calculate the amount of ultrasound which would be transmitted by the skin if it were to go through an air skin boundary. So uh, this equation calculates is not reflected, so if we want the amount transmitted, we need to do one minus it. And what I've done is I've made both of the numbers to the times 10 to the 6, uh, so those cancel out and we don't need to factor them in. Um, so that's what I've done. I've put the numbers in and we can see that we get a very low percent of transfers, 0.052%. Okay. So when we're obtaining the image, we use a coupling gel. To explain why a coupling gel is needed and state the property of the gel that ensures a good quality image. So the coupling gel is to fix the problem we just identified, that none of it's transmitted. So we use the coupling gel to displace any air between the transducer and the skin. So we get rid of the problem of low transmission. And we pick a coupling gel that has an acoustic impedance as close as possible to skin. So we get maximum transmittance or minimum reflection. So they all go into the human body so we can use them for detection. Okay, so we are going to finish off by talking about traces, which is another type of medical imaging. Um, so one of the things that occurs when you're using a tracer is its half-life appears to be less than the isotope you injected into the person. Uh, so we're going to look at explaining why that is. Um, so normally when you just have a radioactive sample, you leave it sitting there and you can monitor its activity. A biological organism is not just sitting there and it's not going to just keep this radioactive isotope in your system. It's going to go in and things like your kidneys, your liver are going to be processing and removing it as, almost as soon as it enters your bloodstream. So what that's going to mean is if you measure the activity, it's always going to be lower than it would be if you just left it on its own. So that's why we say its biological half-life is shorter. Okay, so the physical half-life of a tracer is 20 days, um, but we administer it to a patient and we have a, a count rate of 2,700 counts per second. And five days later, the corrected count rate, so the count rate minus background, um, is, the is 1,200 counts per second. Calculate the biological half-life of the nuclear. So the first thing we're going to do is calculate the biological decay constant. And we're going to do that using the activity equation. And I'm going to get to calculate it in days to the minus one because we want the half life in days. So that's how I've got that. And then I can use that to work out what the half life is. It is 4.3 days. OK, so. Now we've got the properties of two materials we could use as a tracer. Uh, what we want to do is consider which would be more suitable for a medical diagnosis tracer. So I'm going to take it line by line. So we start with the first one, 
uh, technetium produces just gamma rays, whereas iodine produces beta and gamma rays. Um, so beta is not great because it will stay inside the body and is more ionizing than gamma. So it's going to deliver more damaging radiation to the body. If we look at the next one, iodine has a much larger half-life, meaning it will be in the body for longer. So again, it's going to deliver a larger dose of radiation. And then finally, looking at the energy, uh, we can see that iodine energy is higher, which means the gamma photon is capable of causing more damage than technetium is. And so all three things put together indicate straight away we're going to be using technetium unless there's a very good reason not to. Um, so just to give you an example of when you might not use technetium, um, you might be investigating something which absorbs iodine a lot in, in terms of its function. Um, so then you'd pick the iodine one. Uh, but given the choice, you'd pick technetium. OK, so that finishes these revision questions on medical physics, looking at the different types of scanners. I hope that's nice and clear and has cleared up any issues. If you have any questions, please feel free to comment and let me know, and I'll try and get back to you as soon as I can. But thanks for taking the time to watch.